always looking for people. If you know people that are in public accounting that are interested, we laughed that we've had two different folks, that one that we actually signed on and should be joining us in a little week. She just finally was with one of the big four, threw up her hands and just quit one day and said, I'm done. I've worked enough 80 hour weeks, I'm not doing this anymore. It's never going to stop. And so we have managed to figure out how to control that time and, and give our people a better work-life balance than what they can find in most places, uh, but yet have a great culture and a lot of fun. Um, we do some interesting things, you know, everything from bourbon tastings to racing go-karts, okay? So um, we don't do them at the same time, but you, know, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, that's a little far out there for accountants to be drinking bourbon or, or driving go-karts, you know? So we do have a lot of fun. So if you know people are looking, we are looking. And uh, I have found it, too, if those of you are looking for controllers and, and different positions like that, the market has changed. It's gotten better. It's much easier to find people. So I feel like things are, again, moving back to normal. Well, I'm delighted this morning to introduce our speaker. Uh, Bill Hauser has agreed to you know, speak this morning. I'm a big Hauser fan, okay? Uh, we've known each other 25 years, At least years. Yeah. Yeah. We both started when we were 10, and, you know, <laughs> and so we've known each other a long time. Um, he is one of the premier estate planning attorneys in Dallas. It's a go-to for us when we have clients that need to sit down and talk about what's going on, what they want to do, where they want to go. So he's going to give us some time this morning. We're delighted to have you and thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Well, good morning. I guess since you're here, you didn't win the Powerball uh, <laughs> yesterday, for sure. And uh, if you all stayed up late last night watching the election results, uh, you know that uh, not much changed. And from our perspective, that's actually a good thing. Um, you know, gridlock in Congress at least provides for us relative stability as far as estate planning, uh, gift tax, estate tax, generation skipping tax, that kind of thing. Uh, and so it looks like things are not going to, to change much for the next couple of years anyway. So let me kind of bring everybody up to the same level of where we are today. So today, uh, each of you has $12.06 million that you can give away during your lifetime or at your death without paying gift tax, estate tax, and it can be sheltered for generation skipping tax, which means it can be sheltered for grandchildren, great-grandchildren, that sort of thing. And Texas actually passed a law uh, that, that went into effect last year that now allows you to keep things in trust for up to 300 years. It used to be about 100 years, 120 years, okay? Uh, now in Texas, you can actually keep things in trust for about 300 years. So what that means is you can actually put $12 million in a trust that can continue from generation to generation to generation for up to 300 years without ever being subject to estate or gift taxes as of today, okay? Um, this exemption amount, uh, when you go to bed on December 31st of 2025, and, and every year it's gonna increase, so next year it's gonna be more, it's gonna be almost, almost $13 million. The next year, presumably, it'll be more. The next year, it'll be more. But when you go to bed on December 31st of 2025, whatever the number is, when you wake up on January 1st of 2026, the exemption amount is gonna be one half of what it was when you went to bed on December 31st of 2025. Unless Congress acts, that's what's gonna happen. So, so it's gonna be one half. So assuming it's let's call it 14 million, you go to bed on December 31st of 2025, it's 14 million, you wake up January 1st, it's gonna be 7 million, okay? Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's Congress. <laughs> There's no rhyme or reason for, for anything. Um, obviously, the, the number of estate tax returns has dwindled because of the increased exemption when I started practicing law. Uh, the estate tax exemption was 600,000. The generation skipping exemption was a million. It was all over the board. Now, at least they have um, unitized the, the, the exemption so that they're all one number right now. So, so 
the gift tax exemption is the same as the estate tax exemption. Of course, you can't use them both. Uh, it's a single bucket. Uh, and the generation skipping exemption is the same, same number as well. Um, so like I said, next year it'll be 12.92 million. So for a couple, that's a pretty big number, right? I mean, that's 24 million, 25 million bucks, $26 million for, for a couple uh, that you can utilize for it. And Congress also passed a very helpful law for us. Uh, it's called portability which means that if one spouse does not utilize all of their exemption, then the surviving spouse, so long as you file an estate tax return, even if you don't owe estate taxes, uh, so long as you file an estate tax return, the, the surviving spouse can then utilize whatever unused exemption of the first spouse. So, so you can actually combine the, the exemptions now uh, for a combined 24, 25, 26 million dollars. Um, if you have an, a taxable estate over and above that, you're taxed at 40 percent. So the next dollar over that is taxed at 40 percent. Now where that gets really nasty and really complicated is if you have IRA, IRAs, 401ks, those sorts of things, if you think about it, when you pull that money out, you got to pay income tax on it, right? Or your heirs. Who, whoever's pulling money out of that account has got to pay income taxes. So if you have those kinds of assets and you're subject to the estate tax, those assets are actually taxed at an effective rate of around 75% when you think about it, okay? Because you're paying estate tax at 40% on them, and then you're paying the income tax on it as you're pulling them out. So. So those assets really, really get uh, tagged. Again, as I said, uh, on January 1st of 2026, it'll go back to, it's 5 million index for inflation from 2016, 2017, whatever date that was enacted. There are uh, still some, some great deductions for the estate tax that I'm just trying to give us kind of a baseline before we go a little deeper. Uh, you can give as much as you want to to your spouse without paying income tax or, or estate tax. So there is an unlimited spousal deduction for estate taxes. So, so we're not going to tax anything until the last spouse passes away. That's when we're going to, when the government's going to tax things. Similarly, uh, charitable deductions are allowed. It gets complicated with, with private foundations and some of those things, but generally speaking, if you leave assets to a charity, then you're also going to get an unlimited deduction, and Congress has not changed that. They, they've messed around with it some, they've talked about changing it, uh, but so far they have not changed that. So, so spousal unlimited deductions and charitable unlimited deductions. I didn't put a slide in here regarding, uh, but I, I put it at the bottom here, consider using SLAT. So a SLAT is a spousal lifetime access trust. And we're doing a lot of those right now. And it's what we're doing is you have a spouse create a trust for the other spouse. The other spouse creates a trust for Husband creates a trust for, for wife. Wife creates a non-reciprocal trust for husband. And then we're taking, in Texas, we're a community property state, which has a lot of great benefits for state tax purposes, income tax purposes. Uh, but it presents a problem when you're trying to fund trust because essentially spouses have undivided interests in the assets that they own as a part of, part of the, the marriage. Um, but with slats, what you do is you take community property assets and you, and you enter into what's called a partition agreement. And, and you're taking community property assets and you make them into separate property assets. So 50% is owned by husband, 50% is owned by wife as separate property, not community property. Okay. Then husband takes 
his 50% of the separate property, follow along with me, and gives it to the trust that he created for wife. And wife takes her 50% separate property assets and contributes them to the trust that she created for husband. And we're not claiming that unlimited deduction. So we're actually filing a gift tax return for the next year and we're using some of this increased exemption amount and allocating it to those assets that are going into trust. But by doing that, now we have taken advantage of this very large exemption historically that we have had. And now those assets are in trust for each of the spouses and will not be subject to gift or estate taxes regardless of what they grow, up, grow to. So you put $12 million in each of those trusts and they grow to be $100 million when one of the spouses die, who cares, right? We're, we're not subject to estate taxes anymore because we already put them in there. Now we're utilizing that, that larger exemption amount. So, so we're doing a lot of that kind of, of, of planning for people uh, before January 1st of 2026 because we don't believe well, who knows what Congress is going to do. But again, based on yesterday, we're not expecting major changes in the gift and estate tax system before 2026. So Congress, in its uh, ecumenical way, decided, well, since we're, we've got this gift and estate tax system, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a step up in cost basis at your death. What that means is that if you bought a share of AT&T at $10 a share back in 1950, and you've kept that share of AT&T, and you've kept it, and you've kept it, and you've kept it, when you pass away and that share is now worth $100, you get a new step up in cost basis on that share of AT&T stock. So your cost base is no longer $10. Your cost basis in that stock or your state's cost basis in that stock is $100. So you could sell it that day for $100 and not owe any capital gains tax on it. That's the offset that they gave us because of the estate tax, okay? Um, it does not include things like 401ks, IRAs, and that sort of thing. So you don't get a, a step up in cost basis for those assets. You still have to pay the income tax on it. But it does apply to almost everything else. So th that's kind of the balancing act we have in estate planning nowadays is trying to figure out, okay, how, how much do we want to take advantage of certain, certain transfer um, abilities when we know that if you do that, you're likely to lose your step up in cost basis. The way that applies in Texas, um, because we're a community property state, is that if one spouse passes away, you get a cost, uh, step up in cost basis on every asset owned by that first spouse, which includes every asset owned by the marriage, okay? So, so every asset gets a step up in cost basis. Uh, so in Texas, again, we're very busy trying to, to create estate planning tools and documents that make sure that we get not only a step up in cost basis at the death of the first spouse to die, but then we get a second step up in cost basis when the surviving spouse passes away. And so we're, we're constantly looking at ways to ensure that we get a step up in cost basis on everything. Uh, a lot of you, may have had what wills back in the old days where you had credit shelter trusts and you know or bypass trusts and then you had marital trusts and that was all because number one we didn't have portability back then which we have now like i said and now we're constantly looking at ways to take advantage of making sure that we can get the step up in cost basis not only at the first spouse's death but at the second spouse's death
So, you know, mainly we're talking about business owners and estate planning and succession planning. This probably doesn't come as a shock to anybody, but about 40% of businesses die with that transition from Gen 1 to Gen 2, okay? Um, it actually used to be a little higher <coughs> than that. It used to be around 45%, so it's come down, and I'm not exactly sure why, but, but I'm grateful for that. Uh, then when you go from Gen 2 to Gen 3, you lose about another 30%. Only about 13% of all family-owned businesses survive to the third generation, and only 3% go on down four generations or more. Uh, as you can imagine, and again, it's not a surprise, uh, most of the businesses in this country are family-owned businesses. There's almost six million family-owned small businesses, or, or however you want to classify them in the United States. So what are some ways that we can get businesses down to Gen 2? Um, how do we plan for, uh, I'm assuming most people here would like to retire at some point in time. How, how do we figure out how to get businesses from one generation to the next generation? Well, obviously, you, you could just sell your business to your child. Uh, disadvantages of that are, number one, you're going to incur uh, capital gains tax on, on the sale of your business. Uh, number two, your child's going to have to come up with, with the cash somehow to do that, go into a bank or, or somewhere to do that. So, so what's one of the ways that we could get, get the company from, from Gen 1 down to Gen 2? Well, we still utilize, and again, this is part of, of the thing that, that Congress hates and part of that Build Back Better plan uh, actually removed this ability. Uh, fortunately, it did not pass. Uh, but what we can do is, is we can do a combined gift and sale, or gift or sale, uh, to what's called a grantor trust. Under subchapter J of the Internal Revenue Code, it provides that if a trust has certain qualifications, certain, certain wording in it, then whoever creates the trust is treated as the taxpayer of the trust. And so it's almost a disregarded kind of entity, okay? So that's called a grantor trust. If I create a trust for my child, and in that trust, I provide that I, as the grantor of the trust, as the settlor of the trust, I have the right to substitute assets. So if there's a building worth a million dollars inside the trust, I have the right to put a million dollars cash in the trust and take the building back out of the trust. If I retain that right, then I am treated as though I am the grantor of that trust and the IRS will not see that trust as a separate taxpayer. It sees me as the taxpayer for that trust. And there's a couple of other rights that I can put in there that make it a grantor trust. Well, why would I want to do that? Well, <coughs> so I can create a, tr a trust for my child, but the IRS just sees me as the owner of that trust, as a, as, as a taxpayer. So then I can sell my business to that trust, and you can't pay capital gains tax on something, essentially I'm selling it to myself, right? So. So I'm not having to, to pay capital gains tax on this transfer. I mean, it's a great tool. I mean, so I sell the business to this trust. I take back a promissory note from the trust to myself. The business is generating income. So, so during my retirement years, I'm still getting an income from selling the business, but I froze the value of the business at the date I transitioned it into the trust, right? So, so whatever that business grows to be for the, for the remainder of my lifetime, it's outside of my estate. I didn't have to pay capital gains tax on it. I'm still getting an income back from that trust and all is well with the world. On top of that, if I organize it well, if I, if I set it up right, then every year 
one thing we I didn't talk about, but but on top of the the exemption amount that you have, the, the bucket you have of twelve million dollars right now, on top of that, every year you can give sixteen thousand dollars to anybody in the world that you want to without having to file a gift tax return and without having to dip into your twelve million dollar bucket. So I mean you if anybody wants to give me sixteen thousand dollars, you don't have to report it, and we're all good to all good to go. Okay, so you do something like this, and every year you can actually forgive however many descendants you have. You can forgive five times sixteen thousand on the note that is owed back to you. So you're reducing this note every year. And it's really not affecting anybody or, or anything other than you're, you have effectively transferred a company. I mean, if you want to give your kids the best chance for success in the future, something like this is a great idea. Um, one thing, uh, or a couple of things, number one, you do have to get an appraisal of the business. I mean, you, you just have to get an appraisal of the business if you're going to tr do some kind of transaction like this um, because you need to have the backup for determining the value used to sell the business because if you don't then the IRS can, can always come back and challenge what the actual value of that business is. Uh, typically we also always file a gift tax return laying out the fact that we actually made this transaction occur because Again, we want to put the IRS on notice, hey, we did this, you've got three years to challenge it. If you don't, we're good to go. So, so let me ask a question. Why does that then increase the likelihood that the business is going to succeed and transition down the line? Because I'm not sure about the, the, the fairs uh, statistics you gave, is that because they can't pay for it, they can't operate it. I'm trying to figure out what does this enhance sure. versus those statistics you, you showed us. Sure, great question. I'm not sure that I have the, the actual answer for you. Um, I think that you're giving your child or whoever you're selling it to a much greater chance of success because they're not answering to a foreign um, debt company. I mean, if, if, a, if a bank is holding the note and that child can't make that bank payment, the bank's going to come in there and grab that asset pretty quickly. If you're holding the note and the child misses that payment, you're much more likely to say, well, let's just reform the note and, and add that payment back into the back end of the note and that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think, you're, I, I think you've got a good point. I think that um, you know, with any business, you've got to have somebody buying it that, that has a sense of purpose like you have and sees the world kind of like you do or, or better, right? And, and has plans to expand the business and make it, take it to the next level and, and that sort of thing, which, which I think is probably the reason most businesses fail is my kids don't work as hard as I do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, again, uh, this is all based on a promissory note. Uh, no gains recognized, but you also, uh, the, the trust can't deduct the note payments or, or interest on the note payments that it's making to back to you, uh, which if it was a bank note, it would be able to deduct that interest, but it can't deduct interest that it's essentially paying to itself. Um, so. That's a negative. You know, an, an, another asset or another tool that we use a lot in succession planning is called a cross-purchase agreement. Most of you are probably familiar with, with these. It's, it's really just an agreement between partners, uh, shareholders, members of an LLC, uh, where they each agree that under certain circumstances, uh, they will, they have obligated themselves contractually to sell their interest in the company back to either the company 
or to another shareholder, whatever else. I mean, if, 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 if uh, Bob and Jane are, are business partners, but Bob really doesn't want to be partners with Jane's husband uh, in the future or Jane's kids, then you're going to enter into some kind of a cross-purchase agreement so that each partner, each shareholder, each member of the, of the company uh, is contractually obligated under certain circumstances to sell it back. Um, usually the triggering events are bankruptcy of the member shareholder, uh, disability, long-term disability of the other member shareholder, uh, can be retirement uh, if, if you're trying to create some sort of way to, to have a retirement kind of plan, uh, and, and most certainly death. Uh, and so, you know, for the death, it's pretty easy. You can go out and you can buy life insurance, and most of these plans are funded with life insurance. So you go get a, a $3 million policy on each of the, the shareholders or each of the members, and either the company pays for it or, or the individuals pay for it and usually get reimbursed somehow from the company. Um, and so if, if somebody dies, that life insurance comes into, into being, and then you use those funds to then buy the other's interest in, in the company. Again, in Texas, because it's a community property state, if, in fact, you enter into one of these kinds of agreements, you need to make sure that the spouse of the, of the employee or the, the owner um, signs off on it as well, so they're agreeing that they are also contractually obligated to, to, to do this sale. Um, but at a minimum, this is a kind of an agreement that you, you need to have anytime you've got some kind of partner, shareholders, uh, something like that. You, you need to have at least a cross-purchase agreement that, that'll take care of handling the transition from, from one thing to another. Uh, finally, if you do decide, hey, I just want to go ahead and, and sell the company during my lifetime, um, if you can convince the buyer to do an equity purchase as opposed to an asset purchase. So there's really two different kinds of, of purchases that, that are typical out there in the, in the world. One is they either buy your stock or your membership interest or your partnership interest. Number two is they buy the assets that are owned by the company. They buy the trucks and the equipment and the fixtures and, and your goodwill and your name and your website and all of that. They just buy those assets. As a buyer, typically they want to, they're going to push you pretty hard to do an asset sale. They don't want the liabilities associated with this ongoing entity. But if you can convince them to to do a stock sale, to do a, a, a sale like this, then you can create what's called the charitable remainder trust. And you can put your business interests into this charitable remainder trust. And the terms of that trust provide that for the rest of your lifetime or for a certain number of years, it is going to pay out an annuity back to you of, of X percent. And, and you have to, and there's computer programs out there that do this for us now, but you have to make sure that at least 10% of the money that you put in there at the end of the day will go to a charitable entity, okay? A qualifying charitable entity. It can be a private foundation, it can be a donor advised fund, but, but you have to make sure at least 10% of it goes to a charitable entity at the end of the day. Well, if you put your business interests in there, and then you have the sale, you're not having to pay capital gains at the time of the sale. And then every year, you're going to be taking out this annuity from the trust. Now, the taxation on that annuity payment is very complex and beyond what we're talking about today. But, but there is some, you're trading off capital gains for a little bit of ordinary income. Uh, but you, you, know, you are at least spreading it out over the remainder of your lifetime or for a certain number of years. Uh, and you didn't have to pay cap gains on, on the initial amount that, that went in there. Um, we're seeing more and more charitable remainder trusts because interest rates are going up. And when you have interest rates going up, then it also means that you're getting able to take larger 
distributions, annuities every year from, from the CRUT. Um, and certainly if, if the laws change and we have more and more uh, or, or capital gains rates go up, uh, we will see vehicles like this used uh, more and more. So, um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for, for questions. Yeah. The charitable remainder trust is at 10% per year or is it 10% one time? It's 10% one time at the end of the trust. There has to be at least 10% of the initial assets that go in. Uh, also, you, you typically get a charitable deduction equal to about 10%. Uh, when, when you actually create this thing. So, so the year of creation and, and funding, you typically get a charitable deduction equal to about 10% of, of that. Yes, sir. I had a question on the, let's say you have a uh, family that, that has the assets over the, the, the 12 million thresholds, and they decide that they want to gift assets to the children now to take advantage of the lifetime exemption. But, but, but they are still alive. Right. And then five years from now, or was it 2026, 20, whatever, when it changes to a much lower exemption, Right. how does that affect that? So we don't know for sure. It depends on how, how the way the tax law is written right now. Let's say that you have, out of the 12 million, let's say you've utilized $7 million of the exemption amount. Right. So, so you still have $5 million left, right. okay? The way the law is written now, on January 1st of 2026, you're gonna have just a zero exemption amount right. because you have utilized all of the available exemption. <laughs> so it's not going to be, oh, I, I get to kind of keep the $5 million even though I've utilized $7 million. Well, no, I'm saying they, they use the entire 12 million. Oh, that, that's, that's what we're doing. I mean, that, that is what we're doing right now, is utilizing the entire 12 million because it's going to be grandfathered. They oh, are well, not. That's what I was asking. Wouldn't absolutely. Grand, grandfather, no. So if somebody has a $50 million estate, they say, you know what, I can live off 25 million, but I'm going to put it in each person gets a, gets a 12 million exemption, or is it they get? Each person gets a $12 million exemption, and so you move 24 million out, out to kids, um, you keep 26 million, and you start buying yachts and going on vacations and trying to spend it so that you don't have to pay tax on the other 24 million. Not that that's gonna happen. But then could the kids, after you take it, after they take it, that $12 million, you know, the exemption, could the kids theoretically start taking their exemption and give to their kids and, and avoid the uh, generation skip? They could, but again, the better way to do that would be to put it into a trust from, from parents' generation. Right. Put it into a trust for kids, allocate generation skipping exemption to that gift. Right. Put the $12 million in there or the $24 million in there and then just have that trust continue on, not just for the child's lifetime, but for the grandchild's lifetime and the great-grandchild's lifetime and so on and so forth for 300 years, and it will never be subject to gift or estate taxes in those other generations. So that, that would be the much better way to handle something like that. If you had a mom and dad that wanted to leave their company to their four children, but they don't want to do it until both of them have passed away, so they do that through their will, no, what, what we're doing a lot of now is, is doing advanced cross-purchase agreements. So the kids are actually entering into a cross-purchase agreement before they've actually inherited the asset. And then once they have inherited the asset, the cross-purchase agreement really becomes effective. Um, you know, one of the issues I, I debated about how much to spend time on, I just decided to take it out. But, you know, life is really complex. And when you have one child involved in the business, and then you've got another child who's 
a waiter in California hoping to be a, an actor, uh, and then you've got another child who runs an, adopt, uh, an orphanage up in Montana somewhere. I mean, how do you, and, and the bulk of the wealth of the family is in a business. How do you how do you fairly equitably kind of deal with that? How do you how do you handle that? Um, I'm not sure there's really any good way other than to just say if you want to piss off the kid that is really working in the business, split it three ways. You know, I, I, mean, I mean, I mean that is not the right answer. I, I know that for sure. Um, whether you give the other kids a, a finite amount of money uh, or you, give, you use other assets to give to the other kids and you leave the business to the one that's working in the business or you create some kind of a promissory note whereby the kid that's working in the business just has to pay his siblings a you know, million dollars each and then he, he's, he's free of any other obligations to him. Um, but, I mean, one of the worst things I think you can, you can do as a family, and I think one of the reasons so many companies fail, is you have the kid that is COO of the company who really gets it, who loves it, and all of a sudden he's got three other shareholders that he's having to answer to who are getting to vote and who are, uh, you know, having a voice in the company. The other thing I've seen done uh, you can take a company, and it doesn't matter whether it's an LLC or a corporation or a partnership or what, you can f recapitalize it essentially so that you have somebody who is voting and somebody who is non-voting. And at least giving the voting shares, the control of the company to the child that's involved even if eventually they have to pay out some kind of dividends to the other members, the other shareholders, but they get to, they get to pay themselves a salary for running the company, um, <clears throat> and then they can split the profits with their siblings and that sort of thing. Uh, but, but again, uh, I mean, disaster if you, if you just say, if you, if you pass away with a will that says, I leave everything to my kids equally, and, and you've got one that's involved and one that's not. <laughs> And I read a really, you guys have probably seen this, but over the next 20 years, we're going to have $84 trillion pass from one generation to the next generation. It's the greatest wealth transfer that has ever occurred in the history of mankind is going to happen over the next 20 years. And that's just in the United States. And it's shocking to me when I still get people come into my office who are, 70, I'm not calling that old anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer, um, who haven't dealt with any of this stuff, you know, who, who haven't even discussed this stuff, who, who have business interests and they haven't even thought about this stuff. And I think it's because they're just so busy every day, they're getting up and making sure the business is working and making sure it's working. And, and before, well, a client down in Brenham, Texas, $54 million worth of real estate that they've got down there. And they're like, you know, we just kind of, we're kind of running our company and we'd go buy a piece of property here and we'd go buy a piece of property there. And Bill, I, I just, I, did, I, I never really, didn't, didn't really hit me that we had this kind of money. You know, I, I just didn't, didn't realize it. That we, cause, cause they don't see it, right? I mean, they, they drive the same truck, they go to the same house, they go feed their cows, they do this and that, and they've got a thousand acres on the Brazos River that the taxing jurisdiction says is worth $10 million. Um, but it's ag, so they're only paying, you know, $1,000 a year or whatever in, in property taxes. Um, but it, it, there are, you may have heard this again as well, but the, the gift and estate tax to a large extent, really is a voluntary tax right now. I mean, to a large extent, it's a voluntary tax. Um, <clears throat> there are all kinds of tools that we have that can help you not pay that tax. But if you just pass away and don't do anything, you're writing a check. I mean, I've seen <laughs> checks 
for $48,384,000 to the U.S. Treasury. And you just send it in. So. You didn't talk about valuation discounts. No, I did not. Near and dear to my heart. So the okay. crucial thing here. No, the no, you're exactly right. <laughs> so as a part of this, uh, when we talked about sale gift of a business to a grantor trust, to the extent we can, and, and it's difficult if you have an S Corp, but, but we can actually do it. But to the extent we can, typically what we're doing is forming some vehicle like a family limited partnership, which is effectively just a limited partnership. You put assets into that limited partnership, so you put the stock in a corporation or whatever else into a limited partnership. And because of the restrictions that are in the limited partnership, so for instance, um, it can only be transferred to <clears throat> members of your family. Uh, it can't, can't go to anybody else without everybody agreeing that it can go to everybody else. Because of the fact that in a limited partnership you have a general partner who determines whether there are distributions made, who determines, um, it's essentially like a voting and non-voting shareholders. The general partner is the one that has all of the control. And the limited partners have almost zero control. But, so when you put assets into this family limited partnership, you can go to a valuation firm and they can look at the assets, they can look at the partnership agreement, and they will come back and they will give you a value for a 1% interest as a limited partner in that partnership. And depending, again, on the underlying assets, you're going to get a discount equal to somewhere between 25, well, 20% and 45 or 50%. And the reasons for that is twofold. Number one, it's called lack of control. Because a limited partner doesn't have any say, then they're going to discount that value. Number two, it's lack of marketability. Because this partnership is not on the New York Stock Exchange or the or the NASDAQ or whatever else, it doesn't have a, a wide circulation of potential buyers, and so you're gonna get a discount for that. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If my interest in a partnership, if I look through the partnership to the assets owned by the partnership, if my interest is a 1% interest, and if I look through the partnership, that would equal 100 dollars worth of assets that are owned by the partnership. I'm not going to get paid $100 for that interest in which I don't ever get to say whether a distribution is made from that partnership. I don't get to say how that $100 is ever invested. It's a lot more akin to a closed-end mutual fund um, that, that is publicly traded that has a discounted value. And so I'm not going to pay that. And where that, that comes into play is, so that then means, let's say I've got a $30 million business, and I'm trying to take advantage of this $24 million exemption. If I put that $30 million business into a family limited partnership, and then I either sell it or I give it to a grantor trust, and I go get a valuation, I may get a valuation of my interest at only 24 million bucks. So now I can transfer it for less than what the actual business is really, really worth. And I can take advantage of that delta and not have to, to pay gift and estate taxes at all on it. Um, but, you know, IRS has been attacking this and attacking this and attacking this, and they've been losing and losing and losing except for cases where dad is literally in the hospital and stage four colon cancer and we create the family limited partnership and then we, you know, I mean, those are the, case, the, the only cases that they've lost is, is those deathbed kind of transfer sorts of cases. Now there's restrictions, but, but Congress is constantly, again, part of that Build Back Better was get rid of grantor trust, 
get rid of discounts for partnerships. Um, of course, reduce the estate tax exemption. They wanted it to go back to $3 million, and they wanted the tax rate to go back up to 55%. Um, and that's what it, when I started practicing law, it was, like I said, $600,000 exemption, and we had a maximum tax rate of 60%. Any other? Yes, sir. Ballpark. Take a ten, twelve million dollar business. What's what's ballpark cost to set up like a grant or a trust? Fifteen or so grand. Again? About fifteen thousand for the sale and the, okay. all of that. Okay. Yeah. That it. That's it. All right.